After losing everything, he trains to become the strongest warrior and takes revenge. The Labyrinth City attracts people who want to be adventurers from all parts of the country. People of various species and backgrounds come there to grow stronger, hunt monsters, and earn fame and money. Nick is one such adventurer who seems to have it all. He is an excellent swordsman, has a wonderful girlfriend, and is a member of a reputed party. Everything was going well with him until one day the party leader, Argus, who was also his foster father and teacher, called him. Argus told Nick that he doesn't want him in their party anymore because he doesn't have the mindset of an adventurer. He accused him of being too self-important and righteous because he tried kicking out a party member who was stealing money from their funds. This completely blindsided Nick, but his misfortunes were not over yet. Later that day, he meets his girlfriend Claudine in a tavern and tells her that he was kicked out of his party. He was expecting her to be sympathetic towards his situation, but it turned out that Claudine was a gold digger. She calls Nick a useless loser because he has lost his job now and dumps him without a second thought. Devastated after being heartbroken twice on the same day, he sits on a fountain, unable to notice that he is being drenched by rain. Suddenly, a blue-haired girl comes to him, and he tries shooing her away, but she simply gives him a ticket to her show. She reveals that she is an upcoming idol named Agate and asks Nick to come to her show if he has nothing better to do. She leaves the ticket and her umbrella with him and runs away, calling him Mr. Stray Dog and asking him to come for sure. Nick decides to check out her show because, why not? But as soon as he sees Agate perform, he gets totally hooked on it. He becomes an idol otaku and spends all the money he has on Agate merchandise. The next day, he goes to the Adventurer's Guild because he needs more money to spend on merchandise. He tries to find any party that would take him in, but everyone has their party full by then. Nick then spots a blonde guy standing alone in the corner and decides to talk to him. However, self-doubt creeps in as he recalls how he was kicked from the last party, so he fumbles the opportunity, and someone else recruits the blonde guy. After failing to talk to a single person all day, Nick heads to a tavern for an early drink to forget about his failures. He sits down alone at a table, drinking cheap beer and eating flavorless food, while parties around him keep chanting slogans about the power of friendship that disgust him more than his dull food. Suddenly, a group of three people arrive in the tavern, and they have to share Nick's table because no other table is free. They sit down one by one, and Nick can tell that they are not here together. The first of them is a rich girl wearing fancy clothes and carrying a wand with a big magic stone. Nick realizes that she is from a noble family but wonders why a person like her is here. The second guy looks like a priest from his uniform but he is already drunk and he is smelling of cheap women's perfume, which makes Nick realize that he just came here from the red light area. On top of that, he also doesn't have the medal of a cleric, which means that he was fired from the church. The last person is a dragon girl who has scars all over her body, and Nick realizes that she has seen her fair share of battles, but deep down, she seems like a scared, injured animal. Finally, the booze arrives, and Nick wants to make a toast to everything he lost today, and to the three losers sharing the table with him. So after drinking the beer, he slams the mug on the table, yelling that they can't trust humans. He was not alone, and everyone else also yelled the same thing at the same time. They look at each other and realize that they are all similar in some way or another, so they end up sharing their stories. The rich girl named Tiana goes first. She speaks about how she was once the top student at the most prestigious magic school in this country. Everyone praised her for her abilities and humility. One day, she went to the cafeteria and found her fiance sitting there with another woman. Tiana didn't suspect anything at first, so she eagerly started telling him about her day and how the teachers praised her for her new magic. However, the fiance turned out to be a misogynistic piece of crap with a very small and fragile ego. He was feeling overshadowed by Tiana's achievements and started yelling at her for being too self-important. The girl with him also accused Tiana of belittling other students who were not nobles like her. She even said that Tana had seduced her teachers to get better grades, and her fiance believed all of that. He didn't even give Tiana a chance to explain herself and broke up with her. Following that, the heartbroken Tiana left the school and got permission from her dad to leave the house and live on her own. She came to Labyrinth City to get a job, but no one hired her. However, as she was sighing about her tough luck on the road, she found an advertisement about a gambling company. Tiana bought the ticket and ended up winning the first gamble of her life. She soon became a full-fledged gambler and lost everything she had, and soon she didn't have any money to even pay the rent. So she decided to try her hand at adventuring and went looking for a party the next day. However, whenever some tried to recruit her, she ended up scaring them away because of her resting face that made her come to the tavern to drink away her misery. Next, the priest introduces himself as Zem, who used to be a respected healer in his small town. One girl from the town often helped him out by collecting a lot of medicinal herbs for him. Zem thanked her and paid her good pocket money for her work. 
One night, the girl arrived at his clinic quite late with some herbs. Zem tried handing her a coin, but she grabbed his hand instead, asking him to love her like a woman. Now, Zem was a man of character, and he told the girl that he was not allowed to date anyone because he was a priest, instead of telling her that she was too young to be dating anyone. The girl was deeply hurt by his words, so she ran away, crying and cursing him. The next day, as Zem was healing his patients, a bunch of priests entered his clinic and brought him out. Zem saw the helper girl behind them looking quite sad and hurt. He immediately tried to reach her and ask what happened to her, but he soon found out that the girl accused him of harassing her just because he didn't accept her proposal. She began crying, throwing the coins she got from Zem, saying that he gave them to her as hush money. Well, without even being given a chance to explain himself, Zem was locked up in a shitty prison for three months. When he was taken out of jail, he was paraded in front of the angry people before being banished from his hometown forever. Zem soon arrived at a rundown inn in a nearby town, where the beautiful olive-skinned lady knew him already. She greeted him with a smile, and Zem noticed that she had severe back pain, so he offered to heal her. He healed her all night in the bed, apparently, and in the morning, the lady felt much better. She told Zem that she believes that he is a good person. She told him to go to the Labyrinth City and become an adventurer to live his life freely without any guilt. Not only that, she gave him a bag with some cleric clothes, a staff, and a magic book. Zem said that he could not take it, but the woman urged him to keep them because they once belonged to a friend of hers back when she was an adventurer. After that, Zem took a liking to mature women, and he was in the city to have fun with them, while working as an adventurer. The dragon girl is the last, and as Nick asks her to share her story too, she gets startled. She says that something precious was stolen from her by someone close to her, and everyone is embarrassed as they think she is talking about her virginity. Well, it turns out that the dragon girl, Curran, is too drunk to elaborate properly. They drink some more, and the next morning, Nick wakes up to find himself in a strange place with his drinking buddies from last night. Tiana tells everyone that this is her room and tells them to get out. Everyone heads out, but then Nick suddenly asks them to stop. He asks them if they think that getting separated here is the right choice for them. He says that if they stick together, they can make enough money to live comfortably. He emphasizes that they are all outcasts who have no place anywhere, so they should just create a party amongst themselves. They all immediately hook onto the plan and go to the Adventurer's Guild to register themselves. The old receptionist looks at them and notices that Nick is the primary offensive player of a well-known party, and Kern is the only person in history who was able to come back from the sea level dungeon alive by herself. She asks them what their name will be, and Nick replies that they will be known as the survivors. That night, they all sit down while Nick tells them that they have all been betrayed before, so he would like to set some rules to ensure it doesn't happen again. The first rule is that no one interferes with others' lives and should mind their own business. Secondly, they will equally keep an eye on the money, making sure that it's not entrusted to just one person. Third and most important of all, no matter what, they will survive each and every day. The next morning, they begin by starting to explore the G-level dungeons, which are very easy, but they have to finish the boss to get promoted to the next level. Because Zem and Tiana have never been in an actual battle, Nick teaches them the ropes of how to deal with monsters. He shows them a slime monster and tells them how to kill it and take out its core, which they can sell in the market. Everything seems to be going fine as they keep chatting and laughing alongside each other when they finally reach the next floor where everyone is taking out these cores. Tiana tells them that this is very easy and even she can fight stronger opponents as she has defeated goblins and even an orc. Just then, she ends up slipping on a slime while another one latches onto her face. She takes them out while Nick laughs, telling her to be more careful. Tiana, however, overreacts and out of irritation, tries to shoot the slime with her ice magic attack, but ends up engaging in a little friendly fire. Thankfully, Curran is an experienced adventurer and blocks her magic with her sword, but the vibe changes as Tiana tries to apologize. But Curran flies off the handle, telling her that she tried to trust her, but this is what she is doing the very first day. They stay at odds with each other for the rest of the time and finally they are able to reach the top floor. While walking, Zem comments about the huge pink slime ahead and Nick replies that it's the boss of slime that they have to defeat. Without a second thought, Tiana, the giant idiot, ends up rushing towards the boss and using powerful ice magic on it. The icicle freezes the slime, but just when she thought she won, the slime explodes, drowning them with its goo. They all come out of the dungeon, achieving their objective, but now they have to wash the sticky substance off of them. While washing themselves, Nick tells Tiana that she needs to chill out and ask for advice when she knows nothing about something. He also tells Zem to stay at the end as he has zero offensive capabilities. He realizes that none of them trust each other even a bit, so he starts an exercise with them. He strips down to his pants and lays everything in front of them before explaining that he is a swordsman who is good at hand-to-hand -hand combat and small weapons but can't use magic, can't heal anyone, and can't even use heavy weapons like Curran. 
He explains that people are scared if they don't know what the other person can do, but now they know his exact limits, which will hopefully result in them trusting him more. Slowly, the priest ends up explaining his powers and weaknesses, telling them that he is good at healing people, but has absolutely zero offensive capabilities and can be easily defeated by any kind of magical or physical ability. Tiana goes next, and in order to show how apologetic she is, she ends up going in front of Curran and telling her that she is good at ice and wind magic, but can also do lightning and earth magic. While her biggest weakness is fire magic and close quarter combat. She then goes back and sits on her log, shivering after feeling rejected by Curran, but she ends up throwing a fireball near her to start a small fire that can keep her warm. They make up eventually and end up going to the goblin forest, where they are attacked by a bunch of goblins. Nick explains that these goblins are not very strong, but they attack in groups and can lay traps if the adventurers are not careful. One of the goblins tries to hit Zem, who is able to block the attack before Nick kills the goblin with a swift slash. He then goes ahead and chops off a bunch of goblins into tiny little pieces before Zem is again saved by Tiana from an attack. They defeat the first wave successfully, while Nick asks Tiana to find where the other goblins are hiding, as she has an ability to detect magic. She tells them that there are around 10 more goblins ahead before getting a bit flustered as she tells them that she has felt the presence of a goblin, which seems different as it has five times the magic of any regular goblin. Nick immediately becomes alert and tells them that it must be an evolved form of goblin, known as a hobgoblin. He tells them that hobgoblins can be extremely powerful and are usually found in later stages. Zem asks whether they should retreat, but Nick replies that they can't retreat as otherwise the goblins will start attacking the nearby villages. He devises a plan, telling them that the hobgoblins are basically immune to magic, so their best bet is heavy physical attacks, which only Curran can deliver. He tells Zem that he and Curran are going to go on the offensive, while his job is to keep buffing them and Tinana will provide cover fire. They all agree with the plan and the battle starts. Both Curran and Nick start running towards the goblins, while Tiana uses her ice shard ability to kill a bunch of them, and Zem keeps buffing them. The hobgoblin calls forth some more hidden goblins, while Nick makes quick work of the ones in front of him. Curran trusts Tiana and keeps running ahead, while Tiana uses her ice shards to kill the goblins in front of her. Curran makes a beeline for the hobgoblin and delivers a massive fiery sword slash, killing it immediately, while Nick finishes off the rest. They congratulate each other, and then Nick explains that they need to extract the horns of the goblins, as they are to be sold in the market. Curran eventually ends up warming up to them and finally revealing her backstory. She tells them that dragon people are always supposed to be working alongside a hero, whom they support with their lives. A man named Kalios was that person for her whom she met recently. He was always very kind to her, and in return, she was always ready to risk her life for him. One day, he told her that they needed to go inside a C-ranked dungeon to take care of things, and obviously, she agreed quickly. Before going inside the dungeons, however, she ends up putting all her important stuff, including an heirloom pendant that her father gave her, inside a bag for safekeeping, but Kalios comes at the last moment and tells her that they can't really carry that much load, so she should just leave the bag behind. She obviously trusted him and ends up going alongside his two cronies deep inside the dungeon. She kills a bunch of insect monsters, while the others simply reap the reward. Later on, Kalios tells her that they have to fight the final boss now, which is a giant snake inside a pot. He explains that if the snake sees them, it will hide inside the pot, where they can't hit it with magic attacks, so Curran needs to attack the pot itself, so that it comes out to attack her, and then they will end it. Curran agrees and immediately rushes towards the pot, moving it, which makes the snake monster emerge from the pot, and it starts attacking her. One of the mages uses a fire attack on the snake, after which the snake starts charging up for a magic attack of its own. Curran asks Kalios what's happening, but he tells her to keep attacking it and not worry about it. She believes him yet again and keeps the snake engaged while waiting for Kalios to help her. At the end, the snake ends up capturing her and using its toxic breath on her, wounding her as she falls to the ground, barely conscious. She notices Kalios walking up to an exhausted snake as he kills it with his sword and tells Curran that the snake gets extremely exhausted after using that deadly poison attack and that they only needed her to do that. They laugh at her, leaving her to die as they walk outside of the dungeon with all the rewards. She somehow managed to escape the dungeon and crawled her way back to the tavern, where they were staying before falling down in front of the main door. Everyone around the area surrounded her and started asking her questions as Kalios had told them that Curran died in the dungeon. She asked them where he was, but the tavern owner replied that he left the city a while ago. Curran immediately rushes up to her room, where her worst fears come true as she finds her bag, which contained the heirloom pendant, which was the Dragon King's jewel, to be missing. She walks out, completely devastated, looking for any sign of Kalios, but isn't able to find any. 
One day, she spotted a very famous solo adventurer and gourmet named Fifs. Curran started following him around, went to every restaurant he went to, and started filling the void in her heart created by Calios with good food as she learned from Fifs. After a while, however, her money ran out and she made it her primary goal in life to earn money and eat more delicious food, and that's when she met her party. The next day, Nick spends some time with Curran in the market, he eats snacks with her and talking to her about life in general, which makes their trust even stronger. That evening, they go back to the tavern, where a lot more people seem to be recognizing them. The assistant receptionist calls them upstairs, where the old receptionist is waiting for them with a special job only they can do. She explains that there is a special facility, created by an ancient civilization, that created a sword by using a technology that is lost today. Their job is to recover that sword, for which they would be paid very handsomely. Nick takes all of the details, and the next day they enter the facility, killing the monsters and moving forward. The facility seems to be very technologically advanced for the time, as it has cameras, automatic lights, and everything. They reach an area where a green lamp is lit, but when Nick tries to check it out, the wall gives way and opens up to a giant dark room. They all venture inside the room, where the lights turn on and a voice starts talking to them, congratulating them for their journey till now. They realize that the voices are coming from a broken sword in the middle of the room, but soon realize that this is supposed to be the legendary sword that they were sent to retrieve. They think about it for a while before grabbing the sword, as the sword resists, asking them not to sell it, as it has already been locked inside here long enough, and wanting to see some action. Suddenly, a huge explosion occurs, and the sword tells them to get ready as its guardian. The golem is woken up because of this. Through the dust, a giant blob-like creature emerges and starts walking towards them with a mighty growl. Quick to the trigger, Tiana immediately launches a bunch of icicles on the monster, but is able to absorb them, while Curran runs up to the monster to slash it to pieces. The sword shouts at her to back off, but Curran doesn't listen, while the monster ends up shooting the icicles back at her. One of the icicles hits her in the stomach, while the other one hits her on the head, knocking her down. Zem immediately starts healing her, and Nick decides to go in for an attack, realizing that the conditions could become really bad really soon. He tries to cut through the legs, but the golem immediately regenerates and starts attacking him. Nick shouts at the others to quickly get Curran up and to run towards the door so that they can escape. He keeps dodging the attacks while the sword strapped to its back screams at him that no ranged attack or sharp weapons can hurt the monster, and that he should use it, as that's the only way the golem can be killed. Nick decides to follow the instructions and grabs the sword, as the bladeless sword immediately emits a bright light and becomes more or less an energy saber. The rest of the party is trying to break through the door, but Tiana reports back that the door is indestructible, and they can't really do anything about it. The golem attacks Nick again, but this time he dodges the attack and slashes at the golem, cutting one of his arms. Shockingly, however, the chopped off part of the golem gets a life of its own and grabs Nick, while the golem punches him through the shelves and into a hole in the ground. Tiana immediately uses a freezing spell on the golem and screams at Curran to find Nick and make sure that he is safe. Thankfully, her spell seems to work, as the golem gets frozen in place while Curran runs past it into the hole. Surprisingly, however, the golem is able to break out of the ice and start walking towards them. Zem immediately buffs Tiana, while she uses the freeze spell again, trying to buy time for both Curran and Nick to escape. Curran enters the hold and finds Nick buried beneath the rubble, and she immediately starts getting rid of it. Nick tells her to leave him and run away, but she refuses and tells him to shut his mouth as either they are all getting out of here together or none of them is. With this, she removes the final stone from Nick and helps him up as his faith in her becomes even deeper. Suddenly, the sword tells Nick to say a particular spell. Meanwhile, Zem and Tiana are at the end of their ropes, as they don't have any magic power left, while the golem keeps coming towards them to finish them off. Just when everything seemed lost, however, Nick emerged from the hole and blasted the golem into small pieces. Tiana and Zem are shocked to see that Nick has fused with Curran and become one with a beautiful set of shields and wings. This was thanks to the power of the ancient sword, which is actually the Sword of Bonds. The core of the golem still seems to be active as it regenerates once again, but Nick is extremely powerful in his fused state and uses his sword to completely destroy the golem, leaving his core to fall to the ground. Suddenly, Curran and Nick separate and lay on the ground, breathing hard with the sword in their hands. They are finally able to go back to the guild, where they end up giving a replica sword to the old receptionist lady, as the sword transformed into a little white-haired boy named Kizuna, and he begged them not to sell him to another antique shop. Thankfully, Everything ends up working out, and they go back to Tiana's place, where they distribute the money equally, before going their own ways to spend their leisure time. Later, Nick and the party assemble in a tavern, where Nick shows them the amount of money they have left after they have all spent their money. 
It turns out that they barely have any money even to buy some snacks, which saddens everyone but Nick gets their hopes up by giving them a pep talk and rallying them to start going to the next dungeon. They enter a dungeon and find an icy lake, within which a bunch of creatures are frozen. They also spot a giant ogre sitting on the ice, and they all creep up to a high ground keeping their voices low and preparing for an ambush. Curran ends up going even closer to the monster, treating this as some sort of game, which excites Kazuma, who wants to prove himself so he simply runs up to the ogre, shouting at it, which kind of destroys the ambush. He takes out his sword as the monster raises its icy club hitting Kazuna, but thankfully he is able to block the hit with the help of his sword. This surprises everyone as the ogre seems to be pretty strong, and they didn't expect Kazuna to simply block the attack with his skinny sword. The ogre backs off and shoots an ice blast at him, but Kazuna simply bats it away as if he were playing a game of tennis. He immediately rushes up to the monster and tries to hit it with his sword, but the ogre blocks it with its club. Kazuna simply smiles and uses another amazing ability that makes him a clone of himself, and he surrounds the ogre, slashing at him from both sides and killing him immediately. They all surround him, while Nick comments that he feels a bit tired even though he didn't do anything. Kazuna replies that it's because he used Nick's stamina and mana to perform these skills because they are connected together. They come out of the dungeon, and while Tiana and Zem want to rest, Curran, Kazuna, and Nick are hungry, so they start walking to a nearby food establishment. As soon as Nick looks at the diner they were visiting, his heart drops as he realizes it's the same diner that he and his ex-girlfriend used to come to often. Also, this was the place where she dumped him as well. He tries to talk to the others so that they can go and eat somewhere else, but they are already in and he is forced to follow. After going inside, they order their food, but Nick seems to be down in the dumps. Suddenly, he hears a familiar voice and turns around to see his ex-girlfriend Claudine with another young guy sitting on the same seat where she used to sit with him. He notices that the guy seems to be giving her a gift as a birthday gift, while she tells him that she needs some money to go back to her hometown as her mother is pretty sick. The poor, naive guy immediately tells her that she needn't worry as he will figure something out. Nick has had enough of this and he goes over to their seat and sits beside the guy, much to Claudine's horror. The poor guy seems to be very confused, while Nick asks the how many times her birthday comes in a year because a couple months ago she just celebrated her birthday with him, where he gave her a gift. The guy seems to be extremely confused, while Claudine turns towards him and tells him to piss off. Nick pokes her further by saying that he thought her mother was already dead because she needed money for her funeral a couple of months ago. This aggravates her, and she gets up from her seat and throws the gift at Nick before rushing off. The guy looks at him sadly, while Nick tells him not to worry as he dodged a bullet. The next morning, Nick and his party sit around a tavern for some breakfast when suddenly a huge tiger guy pours a drink all over him. Nick looks unfazed as he finds out that his ex-girlfriend and the tiger guy have come over here to take their revenge. The tiger guy named Leon says that he heard Nick was annoying Claudine. Nick simply smiles and tells him that he doesn't talk to gold diggers anymore. In response, Leon tells him to settle the matter outside and both the guys go outside alone. They enter a dark alleyway where Nick gets ready to fight, but Leon immediately starts apologizing and tells him that he's pretty done with Claudine and is thinking of dropping her off as he has used her enough to earn money. It turns out that Claudine is a member of Leon's party, and she was working with him to rip people off. Leon thinks Nick is also ripping off the party he is working with currently and asks him to join their gang after he is done stealing all their money. This angers Nick, who simply delivers a massive uppercut, which sends Leon flying. The cat immediately gets up, and like a total coward, draws out his mash sheet before trying to attack Nick. Nick, however, simply dodges his attack before counter-attacking and pinning him to the ground in an arm lock. Suddenly, he is blown away by a magic attack on his back. He turns around to spot a magician who seems to be on Leon's team. Before they can attack Nick together, Kern arrives and uses her tail to hang the nerdy magician upside down, while Nick simply walks away. Leon tries to attack, but is forced to stop as he sees the old lady of the guild, who tells him to piss off immediately before she calls the guards. Leon, however, tells her that he is officially challenging Nick to a duel, to everyone's surprise. They all go inside and Leon reveals that they are going to have a mathematical duel in which Nick and he will fight each other in the ring while one person from each team will solve math problems. Whoever solves the questions faster and gets the right answers will give their teammate a free hit on the other person. This kind of duel is pretty new to everyone, apart from Nick. The old lady brings out a bag in which slips with the names of every member of each team are written, so that the people who will solve math problems can be chosen. From Leon's team, Claudine is chosen, whereas unfortunately from Nick's team, Curran is chosen, who doesn't even know basic mathematics as she never had to use it. Curran is blown out of her mind and is extremely nervous, unable to even say anything because she knows she can't do any math. 
Later, Zem gives her a practice exam to see what her level is, and it turns out that even the most basic math questions are out of her reach, as she is only able to do 20% of them correctly. The next day, Curran started studying with everyone's help, while Nick sent Zem to drink and collect information on the Tiger Gang. Finally, the day before the final battle, they all assemble at his place, which is quite untidy. Anyway, Zem reports back that the Tiger Gang cheats every single time by using magic crystals that let them communicate with each other telepathically. This means that they can easily use the third member as the person who does all the actual calculations and tells their teammates all the answers. Curran is beyond sad, as she is already trash at mathematics, and now that the other team is cheating, she feels like there is no way they could win. Nick, however, has a plan, which he shares with the rest of the group members, who feel a bit more rejuvenated, as they have an effective way of capturing the culprit now. The next day, Nick and Leon stand in the ring, while Curran and Claudine sit opposite each other, ready to solve the questions thrown their way. The battle starts as the old lady delivers the questions to them, while Nick and Leon start testing the waters by throwing some light jabs at each other that barely connect. Curran looks at the questions and realizes that she has attempted these questions before and she happily starts solving them while the b starts telling her that there is no way she can do anything against her. Thankfully, Curran is able to solve the questions before Claudine in the first round, but it turns out that she only got 80 questions correct, while Claudine got 98 questions correct. So Curran loses this round and Liam gets a free hit on Nick. He punches him straight in the gut, knocking the air out of him. Curran gets very worried as she believes she is the reason why Nick is getting hit. The next round starts and the question sheet is delivered to them, and the match starts as Nick tries to push Leon to try and gas him out, but the Tiger is smart and simply keeps backing off and dodging. The round ends once again with Curran losing to Claudine, resulting in Nick taking another massive punch to the face. Curran gets terribly afraid and apologizes to Nick while he starts bleeding and tells her that he believes in her and is totally sure that she will make them win the next round. This gives Curran the required boost as she starts trying to solve math once again. Chiana quickly starts scanning the entire crowd, trying to find out who will help the cheat, only to realize that no one is using any kind of magic crystal as of now. This makes her realize that the other team thinks that they can easily defeat Curran without cheating, and that's why they are not trying to. If this happens, it will ruin Nick's plan, so they start executing part two of the plan, while Nick tries to buy time. Tiana draws attention towards herself and tells everyone that the matches are taking too long to finish, and that they should solve all of the problems at once so that the match ends in just one round and the loser can take all of the penalty punches at once. This surprises everyone, but the public, who is getting bored of the pace, enthusiastically agrees and all of the questions are given to both of the players at once. Tiana knows that this is a gamble, as Curran doesn't know how to solve these questions at all. However, she knows the questions and starts filling out the sheet, which scares Claudine. Even though she knows she could do all the questions herself, she starts doubting her speed and resorts to cheating by using her magic crystal to communicate with a nerd, who is hiding in a clock tower with a calculator. She starts telling him the questions, and he immediately starts telling her all of the answers. Tiana scans the entire area again, and thankfully, this time she is able to spot the nerd far away. She leaves the arena alongside Kizuna and Zem, and goes over to the watchtower to apprehend the nerd magician. Leon seems to notice that something is off and tries to warn Claudine, but is unable to do so as Nick keeps pushing him by using a bunch of attacks. Meanwhile, Tiana and the others reach the tower and capture the nerd, which results in Claudine getting frustrated, and she loses her cool. Suddenly, Tiana enters the arena alongside the tied-up nerd, who simply smiles, while Tiana shows them a magic crystal. The old lady immediately realizes what is happening and disqualifies the tiger team calling guards to take them away. Nick and the party later go on to the tavern to have dinner and celebrate their victory. That night, since they also earned some extra cash, Tiana decides to go to a casino. Meanwhile, Kazuna has heard about the special ice cream only sold at that particular casino, so Nick is forced to babysit him. They enter the casino and Kazuna gets in line to get his ice cream, while Tiana sits down on a table, starting to gamble away with four other participants. She starts winning huge sums of money, while Kazuma is disappointed as the ice cream is finished before he can get to try it, and he tells Nick that he would rather leave now, but Nick tells him to watch how people gamble for a bit. Meanwhile, Tiana is ripping off a shabby guy who is spending the money for a rich blue-haired girl behind him. Suddenly, there is a huge ruckus, and people start running here and there as a giant tiger monster appears inside the casino and starts wreaking havoc everywhere. He slaps away all of the guards and ends up cornering Tiana, asking her where Nick is. She suddenly realizes that this huge monster is Leon, whom they had a battle with the day before. 
It turns out that after getting captured, Leon was overwhelmed by his hatred towards Nick and ended up using a special sword similar to Kazuna and escaped the prison. The sword evolved him into a monster, and he started following Nick's scent, reaching the casino. He tells Tiana to reveal the location of Nick, but she replies that she doesn't know where he is. Even when he threatens her, she simply starts smoking, which leaves the tiger man confused. Suddenly, she uses the lighter infused with some magic to blast the monster away and starts running with a blue-haired woman who was also stuck with her. The tiger man heals up quickly and throws a bench at them, which blocks their path and sends them flying. He starts walking towards them, while Tiana tells the blue-haired girl's boy toy to take her away. The monster walks up to her and grabs his sword, ready to kill her, but Nick arrives just in time and blocks his attack with an energy sword of his own. The tiger gets even more mad on seeing him and starts cursing him before he extracts even more dark powers from his sword and transforms into an even bigger monster. The monster tries to punch Nick, but he elegantly dodges before Tiana tells him to merge with her so that they can put an end to it. They back off and use Kazuna's power to merge together into a beautiful female knight with amazing armor and the ability to fly. Tiana uses an ice wall ability, but Leon goes rogue and blasts through the wall before running astray inside the casino, breaking everything in its path and throwing people around. Tiana uses an ice prism shield, which captures him inside and starts skewering him with icicles, but he is able to escape from the shield as well. Finally, he is put to rest when Tiana uses the cards of the casino that have anti-magic property, so they seal the effect of the special sword Leon had. The big kitty turns normal again and falls asleep after losing his power and Tiana seals the sword in an ice prison so that it can never be used again. Liam is taken again to jail, where Nick visits him a couple of days later, and they both seem to make amends with each other and forget their enmity before Nick tells him to get out of jail soon so that they can go out for a drink. Soon after that, Nick is running around as part of his morning training schedule when he hears a voice telling him to do his best. He is surprised because the voice is just like Agate, his favorite idol, and dismisses it thinking that he is just imagining things. However, it is in fact the real Agate, who is running behind him and encouraging him. She says that she lives in the hearts of her most devout followers, and Nick has finally reached that level. She tells him to take a break now because he must be tired, and Nick decides to obey. But just as he turns around and sees Agate there, he freaks out. Later, they sit by the bench, where Agate checks up on Nick's progress and realizes that he finally has a goal, and is no longer like the stray dog she first met. She claims that she is really happy for him but then keeps getting sidetracked. Agate calms her thoughts, and then tells Nick that the day she gave him the ticket, she was confused about whether she did the right thing. Even after he showed up at her show, she didn't get over that confusion. She was concerned that by giving Nick a ticket, she may have turned him into a desperate fan who would ruin his life trying to buy her merchandise. Every time she saw him in the stands, that guilt deepened, which is why seeing him lead a good life makes her happy now. After hearing all this, Nick tells Agate that if he had not become an idol fan, his life would have been drastically different, and maybe. He claims that he is grateful that Agate pulled him out of darkness, and she is a true idol because of that. She replies that her answer made her feel good, but she is still melancholy about something. Nick knows that something has been bothering his favorite idol because she has suddenly canceled all her shows and public appearances. There is a deep story about her current condition. Agate's actual name is Belle, and she was once a singer in her boyfriend's restaurant that no one came to. That is why no one even heard of her song, and she didn't know what she was doing with her life. One night, a rich, bald man applauded her song and began giving her unsolicited advice. The man told her that he was a producer and asked her if she would like to become an idol. Agate was too stunned to reply, and then her boyfriend, Dunny, came there to confront Baldi. He tried to act stern, but as soon as he heard that idols can make a lot of money, he quickly changed teams and sold Agate out to the man. She was not sure about it, but Dunny appointed himself as her manager, and then Baldi gave them a ticket to an idol concert so that they could know more about it. When Agate went to the concert, she was too shy to even make eye contact with other girls who were also being scouted. But as soon as the idols came on the stage and started performing, Agate was captivated. Her heart was filled with greed in that moment as she also wanted to be like the idols. She wanted people to listen to and enjoy her songs, and thus, she chose to become an idol. The other girls were the same and they all adopted stage names as they trained to become an idol group. While Agate found success and happiness in her new job, her relationship with Dunny worsened. He began asking her for money because his restaurant was doing badly, and she couldn't refuse him. She soon learned that he was blowing through the money he borrowed from her on gambling, and that left her deeply troubled. This change in his attitude forced Agate to think about how their journey started. Dunny just wanted to start a restaurant in which everyone could eat in peace, and there would always be a stage for Agate to sing and entertain the guests there. 
She took a long look at the restaurant, thinking about how times had changed and the same day, she found Mick. She saw his ex-girlfriend break up with him and had pity on the boy. Soon it started to rain, and as Nick was heading back home, a gate followed him. She approached him at the fountain and began a casual conversation that changed his life. Soon after that, Donnie told a gate that he would take her along to the casino, so that she could see him winning big with her own eyes. For some reason, those words felt like a breakup to a gate, but she still followed Donnie. That was the day she met Tiana in the casino, and felt that she was the goddess of gambling. Agate saw Tiana sweep the table and win everything, but she felt that her gaze was always on her. She realized that Tiana didn't want to destroy anyone else but herself, so when she took away all her money, she gave her a smirk and then vanished in a puff of smoke. After that, Agate saw the fused version of Nick and Tiana, but she could only recognize Tiana there. She saw her defeat the oversized kitty with her magic sword and was left in awe. Agate was so impressed by the beautiful paladin that she thought of her as her inspiration. The very next day, the bald producer took care of all of Dunny's debt and told him to focus on cooking without any distraction. However, he also told him to completely end his relationship with their idol, and it was not a suggestion. Donny tried to beg her to rethink things, but Agate told him that the dream he had of opening a restaurant was innocent and fun. She claimed that she wanted to be a part of that dream and was even ready to quit being an idol just for that. However, he stopped caring for her after being blinded by easy money. Agate told him that maybe his life and personality will only get worse the longer he stays close to her, and they must separate. Donny just started laughing as he accepted his fate and the breakup. However, he told Agate that it was her loss and swore that one day he would show her by becoming more successful than her. Donny started walking away and Agate approached him one last time to give him the queen card she picked up on the day she saw Tiana. She gave it to Donny, saying that the beautiful goddess of gambling would protect him. He snatched it from her hands while calling the idea foolish, and then left the room saying goodbye. That was the end of their breakup story and Agate soon saw Donny working from the bottom, but both of them decided not to interact with each other. Fast forward to the present and Agate has returned with a solo show. Nick is among the audience as expected, and soon, Agate comes to the stage. She apologizes to her fans for taking a sudden break and tells them that during the break she met up with a goddess. Agate talks about the casino incident where a beautiful female knight defeated the tiger monster and Nick freaks out on realizing that she was there that day. Agate says that the beautiful and legendary paladin gave her hope and inspiration, and she wrote a new song thinking of her. She starts performing the song with her teammates acting out the supporting roles. Agate swears to the legendary paladin that she will become a real idol, who will bring hope into the lives of her fans. The next day, as Mick is taking a drink after exercising in the park, he suddenly hears Agate's voice. She pretends to be his inner voice and keeps bantering with him, while hiding behind a bush. Nick suddenly asks her if she is fine now, because she looked quite down the last time they met. Agate replies that of course she feels down sometimes because she's a human too. She talks about how people are always surrounded by worries when she suddenly sees a stray puppy in front of her. She gestures for it to come towards her and begins playing with it. Nick suddenly replies to her statement and says that whenever people resolve something that is bothering them, they take a step forward, and that is the best anyone can do. A few days later, Kizuna is babbling about an article in a magazine that talks about the mysterious Stepping Man. He excitedly tells his friends about the Stepping Man, who is said to be a kidnapper with ghost-like powers that no one can stop. Curran says that they should defeat such an evil kidnapper, but Nick tells her not to bother with it because the Stepping Man is just an urban legend. Kizuna gets angry at this, and he rushes to show Nick the witness testimonies, but Nick dismisses them and asks him not to believe everything he reads in a third-rate gossip magazine. Despite that, Kizuna keeps ranting about the Stepping Man, and a green-haired nerd hears it as she is passing by. She puts her card on the window as she introduces herself as Olivia, one of the chief writers of the magazine Kizuna is holding. He tells her that he's a great fan of her work. And then Olivia barges in, telling everyone that not only is she a writer, but an adventurer too. She hops around and does some shabby gymnastic moves to show how cool she is. She stumbles and bumps into Curran, and then heads on her way. Later that night, as Zem is returning from his usual visit to the Pleasure District, he finds a girl walking ahead of him in the dark streets. Suddenly, she gets pulled into the walls of the street and vanishes, and Zem loses half his hangover. On the other hand, Nick had taken Kizuna with him to a live idol concert. They are returning home, chatting about how cool Agate is, when Kizuna suddenly feels that Zem is in danger. They rush to his location and find an invisible phantom trying to hurt him. Nick freaks out because he realizes that the story about the stepping man is true after all. However, Kizuna seems to have noticed the trick behind his invisibility. He throws a sword at the stepping man, but it only bounces away. The stepping man is surprised that they can see him. Kizuna creates his shadow clones to attack, 
but the stepping man jumps away and attacks him with a steel chain, destroying the clones and running away. Kazuna curses him, and then they go to Zem, who has been holding on to the girl whom the stepping man was trying to kidnap. They take her to Zem's favorite establishment, where the boss lady takes care of the girl whose name is Raina. They ask her if she knows anything about the incident and she says that the stepping man has a personal vendetta against her. She thinks that no one will believe her just because she is a kid, but Nick assures her that they do. Raina reveals that her mother always used to leave the house at night to fight the stepping man, but now she is lost and is admitted to the hospital. She says that her mother knew that the stepping man was taking the kids away, but no one believed her. Zem says that they believe in Raina's story because they saw the mysterious kidnapper with their own eyes. He even commends the brave act of Raina's mom, who tried fighting the stepping man alone. His words move Raina, and she gets up with a jerk and requests that Zem accept her as a disciple. She claims that his bravery when tried to save her earlier moved her, and heads towards him, but Nick stops her. He is about to reveal Zem's backstory of how he got betrayed by a girl who wanted to get close to him in the past, but Zem stops him. He tells Rena that she is 15 years too young to be his disciple. Rena asks him how she should train till then, and Zem tells her to rest well here and return home the next morning for starters. He also tells her to never do anything dangerous again and she gladly agrees. She is about to rush towards Zem again, but Nick and the boss lady stop her once again. Suddenly, Kazuna lets out a big disgruntled sigh because the stepping man he was so excited about turned out to be a cheap kidnapper. He is determined to uncover his identity and thoroughly destroy him for betraying his expectations. Following through with Kizuna's wishes, the entire team goes to a Wild West-style bounty hunter guild. They approach the receptionist and ask for information on the stepping man, and she is too busy painting her nails to pay them much attention. She has only seen Nick before, and she tells him that they don't just hand out information about high-ranking bounties to adventurers who have accomplished nothing. However, Tiana and others twist her words to mean that the stepping man has a high bounty on his head, and the receptionist is forced to share information. She gives them the wanted poster of a man called Hale Hardy, who has a mid-level bounty on his head for their first task. She loudly says that team survivors should have no problem dealing with a guy like this, and her words draw everyone's attention. Everyone knows the name of the survivors, but some people are jealous, most notably a dark-skinned guy with a ponytail and eye patch. He says that bounty hunting is not the job of amateurs like them, but Tiana is not going to let anyone walk over them. She declares that they will find the Hale Hardy guy and bring him here, and Mr. Ponytail bets that they won't. He shouldn't have used the word bet because on hearing that, Tiana placed a big fat pouch of coins on the table as her wager. She asks Ponytail to match it, and he gets nervous. Tiana tells all the people in the guild to earn some money to bet on this chance, and the entire guild turns into a big gambling fest with people betting their rent money to their life savings on this little challenge. Soon Nick and the team reach the worst part of the slums where even the knights don't dare to go. The leader of the slums comes to greet them and asks the purpose of their visit. Nick tells him that they are here for a bounty hunt and offers some money to buy information. The old man refuses to tell him anything about his target, but Nick wants to know if anything weird is happening in this area lately. The slum leader babbles about the birth of some puppies and some irrelevant stuff, so the team decides to search for their target on their own. However, as they are leaving, the slum leader gives them one piece of advice. He asks them to steer clear of the person called Nalgava when he is working. He doesn't tell much about Nalgava, but insists that he is someone important. They move deeper into the slum, and the foul smell starts bothering Curran. Soon, they come face to face with some thugs trying to extort a toll from them, but Curran and Kizuna make quick work of them, while Nick grabs their leader and asks him about Hale. The thug tells him the location and then asks him to at least pay for the information. Everyone simply ignores him, but Sem becomes a bit touchy-feely with the guy, saying that he is going to die soon. He tries to diagnose him and asks what is wrong with his body, and after a bit of struggle, the thug says that he hasn't been able to sleep in a while. He throws a tantrum that strangers like them have no right to interfere in his life when they don't understand anything about it, but Curran tells him that they do. Zem then hands the thug a pouch of medicines that can calm him down and says that it is the payment for his information. To thank Zem for the medicine, the thug also warns him that Hale is a swift runner, and he will escape if he sees them coming. They soon enter the area where Hale is and Zem feels bad about the people who have to live in this shitty hell hole. Kizuna spots Hale, who is having some action with his girlfriend. Nick breaks open the door, freaking Hale and his girlfriend out. As Nick declares that they are here to collect his bounty, the girl runs away and Hale tries to keep everyone distracted while trying to escape through the window. Unfortunately for him, Kazuna is already there to cut off his escape. Hale is tied and taken out, but just then, a priest comes there and stops Nick and his group. He asks them where they are taking his patient, and Hale calls the man Dr. Nalgava. 
The stern-looking priest tries to warn the adventurers that no one has the right to mess with his patients, but Nick tells him that they are here to collect the bounty on Hale's head, who has done pretty much every crime except murder. Now Dava calls Hale a fool for wasting his life by indulging in sin, and says that he can only heal diseases and not guilt. He tells Nick that he won't stop him from taking Hale away. He adds that Hale has a serious illness called the Yellow Demon Disease, and he just wants to treat him one last time before he is taken away. Nick tells the old man that his patient may be executed and his treatment can go to waste, but Sem tells him that he is wrong. He talks about how priests should try to save anyone they can, and then Naldava asks him if he is also a priest. Sem corrects him, saying that both of them are former priests. He then asks Nalgava the reason he is in such a place, because a priest who can treat yellow demon diseases must be very highly skilled. The man doesn't give him a clear answer. Suddenly, Kazuna asks the bald priest if he has heard about the stepping man who kidnaps people at night, and he replies that he hasn't. Hale laughs at this, saying that this place is full of kidnappers, so who cares about just one person? However, as Nalgava tells him to be cooperative, he tells them about a reporter who comes here a lot and gives candy to kids to talk to her. After that, Nick and his team take Hale to the Bounty Hunter Guild, and the receptionist is impressed that they found him in just one day. Tiana then goes to Mr. Ponytail and takes all the money that was gathered from the bets. He tries telling her that some of it belongs to the people who bet on her too, but she ignores him and takes it straight to the receptionist. Tiana tells the receptionist to buy as much liquor as she can with this money and treat the entire guild with that. Everyone rejoices and yells that Tiana knows how to party and even Ponytail realizes that he lost on all fronts. The next day, the hungover receptionist gives them their reward for capturing Hale, along with information on the stepping man. There are a lot of vague and senseless details about him, like how he fixes people's gutters and tells people who stay up late to go to bed. There is no reliable information, and even the receptionist tells them to find real people to capture instead of imaginary ghosts. Nick tells her that they are actually looking for the kidnapper posing as the stepping man. The receptionist doesn't know about kidnappers, but she knows a person who gives candy to kids to talk to them, and she is right here in the guild. It turns out to be the same writer, Olivia, from earlier, who is talking with Rana right now. Nick and Zem laugh it off, but Kazuma is a bit curious. He remarks that he could not see the kidnapper's face, but they were light on their feet and used chains. Kernan replies that earlier, when Olivia fell on her, she felt too heavy and she might have wrapped the chains around her. While Nick laughs it off, he quickly tells Kernan and Kazuna to block the exits because he suspects Olivia now. He approaches her and asks what she does after giving candy to kids. Olivia acts confused, while Zen whisks the boss lady and Rayna away. Nick then asks Olivia if she has to travel a lot as a reporter, and she affirms. He asks her if her job involves jumping from roof to roof, and she acts clueless. He then directly asks her where she was two nights ago, and Olivia acts like a fool while giving him some pretty stupid answers. But when Nick asks why she takes the children and what her real identity is, she realizes that she is surrounded. Suddenly, she kicks the table and splits it into two. Before Nick can ever react, Olivia is on the roof, and she tears a hole through it as she escapes, and the two pieces of the table fall back perfectly in their place. Later, everyone hangs out at Zem's favorite establishment, where they discuss how creepy it was for them to find that Olivia was the stepping man herself. They talk about how she was too fast, and her movements were unlike anything else they have seen. Kazuna is oddly pissed because Olivia was writing articles about herself as the stepping man, and he doesn't like how she is trying to be the evil version of Peter Parker in this era. Just then, the boss lady tells them that they have a special guest today. A muscular mommy, who is actually Rana's mom, enters the room, walking with the help of a cane, and Rana immediately runs to her. Nick also knows the woman whose name is Ada because she was a member of an A-rank party for many years. Ada gets nostalgic as Nick talks about her adventuring days, and then remarks that she even went on adventures with a guy called Fifths, whom Curran idolizes. Ada then thanks the survivors for taking care of her daughter, and tells them that she is not going to do anything reckless under her watch. Everyone agrees and Reina tries appealing to Zem, calling him master. Ada is surprised to hear that, but Zem is still firm in his words. He tells Reina clearly that whenever he sees girls her age, he is terrified because long ago, a certain girl deceived him and he spent months in jail because of her. After he came out of jail, he developed a phobia of girls who were still young. He could not talk to them and sometimes had difficulty breathing too and he still suffers a bit from that. Raina reminds him that he protected her that night, and Zem says that any sensible person would have done the same in that situation. However, he confesses that when he saved Raina, he felt hope that he could move past this curse that has long plagued him. That is why he wants Raina to wait for 15 years. Adam misinterprets this and tells Zem that she won't let her daughter marry him. Raina steps in to clear up the confusion and tells her that Zem is just her master because she will be more careful when picking up a boyfriend. 
Everyone laughs at the fact that Zem got rejected and after a bit of friendly banter, Ada learns everything. She once again thanks everyone for saving his daughter and then tells them to give up on hunting down the stepping man. She tells them that the stepping man who is most likely the reporter girl is too powerful for them and Nick agrees. Despite that, he is not going to let her kidnap people as she pleases. He tells Ada that she has no right to stop them because they can target anyone who has a bounty on their head. Ada knows that too, and in fact, she was the one who started the idea of a bounty on the stepping man to lure adventurers into fighting her. She now plans to give up on hunting Olivia and thinks that they should leave it to the knights. However, Nick bows before her, asking her to tell them how they can get strong enough to defeat the kidnapper. Ada first makes everyone drink a gourmet mushroom soup, which is quite delicious, but Nick doesn't understand its purpose. Ada tells him that she used magic shrooms for this soup that will bring out their hidden magic potential. She knows that fighting with the stepping man will require a lot of agile movements, both in running and attacking. That is why she believes that properly using their magic is the key to victory. Nick replies that he is not confident with magic, and Tayana says that she cannot cast magic in melee range. Zem says the same thing as her. Kervin says that she can try it, but she is not good at complex things that require brain power. Ada teases them, saying that the survivors are quite quick to give up. She then hands out a magic lighter to Curran, asking her to chant the keyword burn while passing her magic through it. Curran tries doing that, but she can't concentrate and gives up. Next up, Ada gives the lighter to Nick, who is not sure if he can do it. However, he manages to produce a small fire on his first try, and his friends are impressed. He himself is surprised, but says that this small fire won't help them win against the stepping man. Ada tells him that she was just testing his magic potential and not telling him to use fire magic. She then lets out a huge flare using the lighter and tells Nick that if he practices a lot, he can also do this. Soon after that, the training begins, Nick is walking on a tightrope as Ada tells him that the stepping man uses two main enhancement spells, light body and heavy body. Since Nick will be in close combat, she wants to train him using a light body and asks him to jump 10 times on the rope. Nick thinks it would be easy work, so he starts jumping. He lands on the rope each time without any error and everyone thinks that he will be easily able to do it. However, he fumbles on the ninth jump and hits the floor hard. Soon, one night, a girl is walking back to her home after buying some bread, when suddenly, the stepping man arrives there and swoops her away. Luckily, Kazuna arrives there and kicks the stepping man away, while Curran safely catches the girl. The rest of the team surrounds the stepping man and tells her that her game is over now. However, Nick still feels like confirming if Olivia is really behind the stepping man disguise, but he gets no response. Instead, the stepping man just runs away. Kazuna believes that since the stepping man uses attack magic, movement magic, and illusion magic at the same time, either he is very talented or he is using some sort of magic tool. Tiana tells them that they know someone who is an expert in magic tools, and the next day, Nick pays a visit to the jailed Leon. After treating him to some delicious meat buns, Nick asks Leon if he knows about a tool that can help one conceal their presence. The tiger gets serious on hearing this and replies that he must be talking about the Illusion King's jewel, which is usually incorporated in another magic tool to be used. Nick asks how he can counter it, and Liam tells him that to break the illusion, he just needs to take the name of its user. However, Nick took Olivia's name, and the illusion didn't break, which means there is someone else behind the disguise. The next day, Nick is back at his training, and this time, he successfully does a front flip on the tightrope. Ada keeps pushing him on, and this reminds Nick of how he has not trained so hard since the very beginning. He recalls how his father figure Argus taught him how to wield a blade, and more importantly, he told him that becoming a warrior is more than just using weapons. In the present, Nick can easily jump from one clothes line to the next, showing off his agility before landing on the ground. His friends also came there just then. Zem reports that he went around talking to the people whose homes were leaky and had damaged roofs. Nick understands that by doing this, they can figure out the regular routes the stepping man takes because he jumps from one roof to another. He takes a look at the route they have narrowed out and it leads them back to the slums. They ask the slum leader if he has any new information for them and he can't tell them anything apart from the deaths of two puppies. He adds that a dead girl from the slums was recently taken to the common burial grounds, but no one knows anything about her and he doesn't even remember her face. As the party returns from the slums, a thick mist surrounds them and Kizuna senses that an enemy is following them. He warns his friends using telepathy, and then suddenly Olivia jumps towards them from a nearby tree. She starts attacking Nick with some kung fu moves, but he uses the light body magic and jumps over her head to avoid her attacks. Seeing that, Olivia accuses him of being the stepping man, and Nick tells her that she is the one. She attacks him once again, and while Nick dodges, the iron railing behind him gets clobbered by Olivia's heavy punch. 
Kizuna comes to join the fight with his clones, but surprisingly, Olivia can also use the clone magic, and she quickly takes care of Kizuna's clones. Everyone is shocked, but Nick thinks about Liam's words and confidently asks her if she is the real Olivia. On hearing this, Olivia starts acting like a fool again. She says that even though he accused her of being the stepping man, she is not going to hold it against him. Nick is perplexed now, and he suggests that they talk it out. Olivia then tells them that she is a stepping man, but not the stepping man who kidnaps people. She says that back in the day, the name stepping man was used for every weirdo who went jumping around on roofs, but now someone is taking advantage of that. Nick remarks that if she had told them this in the Bounty Hunter Guild, things would have been much easier, but she doesn't care about that. She fixes the deformed railing with brute strength, and then Nick suddenly asks her about the clone skill she used. She tries to threaten to expose Kazuna, who uses the ancient magic, and he says that he will also report her. They decide to come to a compromise and propose to work together to catch the stepping man. After that, they go to the burial house, where the dead body of the kid from the slum is kept. They open the coffin and find nothing strange, but Olivia asks everyone to describe the facial features of the girl in detail. No one can do that, and then Olivia explains that there is something interfering with their senses and cognitive abilities here. They decide to turn around the girl and a small red gemstone falls from her body. Zem picks it up, and Olivia says that it is probably a fragment of the Illusion King's jewel. Everyone wonders why someone would go so far as to hide the identity of the dead girl. Olivia crushes the stone to erase its effects, and they find that the girl has an old burn mark on her arm and a mole under her neck. Zem inspects her eyes to find that they show symptoms of treatment for the yellow demon disease. Later, they search for information about the girl and find that she was the daughter of a blacksmith and went missing over a month ago. They decide to return the girl's body to her parents, and Zem says that they can avenge her after that. Nick asks him if he has figured out the identity of the stepping man, and he affirms, saying that they must stop him at all costs. The next night, as the stepping man is swinging around the city using his chains, Nick intercepts him mid-air and kicks him down. They both land on a building's roof, and the stepping man tells Nick that his light body is still underdeveloped, but his martial arts are good. Nick asks him why he keeps doing crimes in the same pattern over and over again. He wants to know if it is his overconfidence or if he just wants to get caught. The stepping man attacks him, but Nick easily dodges it and then rushes ahead to attack him. He yells that he has figured out the reason why the stepping man kidnaps people and why their bodies are found in the slums. They keep on exchanging blows, and the stepping man says that Nick has not yet figured out the most important thing. Nick tells him that he is wrong and says that he was always curious about why a skilled healer like Nalgava would be working and publishing research papers from the slums. Just as he takes Nalgava's name, the illusion magic comes undone, and it turns out that the stern-looking priest was indeed the stepping man. He congratulates Nick on his deduction, who replies that the dead body they found earlier had the yellow demon disease. Nick wonders aloud how a disease as deadly and infectious as the yellow demon disease is limited to the slums and not spreading to the main city. He says that there must be a human factor behind it, and those are all the words Zem told him earlier. Nick knows that Nalgava kidnaps people to have more test subjects so that he can develop an effective cure for the yellow demon disease. Nalgava says that they don't have anything else to talk about, and Nick attacks him. He keeps blocking his attacks, but then Nick jumps high up and lands a full power kick on him. Nalgava blocks it while warning Nick that the roof won't hold on against this type of pressure, but that is exactly why Nick did it. The roof cracks, and both of them fall into the building below. There, Nalgava finds that he is surrounded by Nick's party members, and even the escape route on the roof is cut off. Zem comes ahead and asks Nalgava why he is doing all this. He replies that his daughter died of the yellow demon disease, and Zem remarks that he has found that out from his research. He talks about how most people think that the yellow demon disease is just an STD, but one day, Nalgava's daughter came into contact with the patient's blood while caring for them, and lost her life soon. Nalgava relives his anger upon hearing this. He says that his daughter just wanted to help people, but they began spreading nasty rumors about her being a loose girl who got the disease by doing the deed with patients. They mocked her even after her death, and Nalgava was furious. That is why he decided to find a cure for the disease to avenge his daughter, and he doesn't care how many nameless people die in the process. Zem asks him how he can be so cruel and inspirational at the same time. Nalgava tells him that everyone has more than just one side to their personality and neither side is false. Zem approaches the old priest and tells him about the girl they just found in the common burial ground. He says that when he gave her body to her parents and explained the cause of her death, everyone in her locality cried for her. Zem says that she was not a random nameless girl because even if Nalgava didn't care about her, there were people who did. Nalgava starts laughing and coughing, telling Zem that even if they stop him here, the problem won't magically end. 
He agrees, saying that despite that, it can only take one step at a time. The old priest gets up, and suddenly, Kazuna feels someone coming, and warns everyone. Suddenly, a magic beam pierces the door and hits Nalgava right in the stomach. The door is kicked down, and a man in demonic armor comes there, telling Nalgava that his time's over now. He walks inside, and Nalgava asks the man why he is here. The armored man replies that he would have preferred to help him, but he has already said too much, so he is here to silence him for good. Zem tries to heal Nalgava, but the armored man hits him away, asking him to save his magic because he is going to kill his team next. Kervin and Tiana attack him with their fire and ice attacks, but he quickly dodges both of them and then smacks them away too. Taking advantage of this, Zem heals Nalgava, who tells him that he is wasting his time. He tells Zem that he is doing the wrong thing by focusing on something else when his teammates are in trouble. Nalgava says that his kindness isn't kindness but self-centeredness, and that is going to get everyone here killed. Zem is in shock from hearing this, and then Nick requests to merge with him because the others are down. He is unable to make up his mind, and in that time, Nick also gets hit down by the armored guy. Zem panics, realizing that because of his indecisiveness, they have lost another chance. He doesn't understand what to do, but then he hears a telepathic message from Olivia, who tells him that she is going to buy him some time in which he should make up his mind. Then suddenly, Olivia appears from the roof and kicks away the armored guy. She walks towards him, calling him a thief of magic tools, a performer of weird rituals, and a provider of weapons to the worshippers of the demon god. She knows the guy by his codename White Mask, but he doesn't know who the hell she is. Olivia goes into full detail to describe herself, and White Mask says that her excessive knowledge is going to get her killed. He charges towards her, but she stops his sword with her bare hands before picking up speed and attacking him from behind. Before White Mask even has time to react, Olivia launches a barrage of attacks on him and cracks his mask, but it keeps on regenerating while they talk. She has realized that the mask is an ancient civilization relic, and her attacks are not going to get through it. In the meantime, Mick and Zem finally perform the union spell and fuse with each other. White Mask is shocked to see ancient magic being used here, and he wonders if they are using the sacred blade that was not used in the last war. The Zemnik Union knows that White Mask is also using something similar to them, and he decides to show it to them. He uses his special power and traps the fleeing Olivia in a red sphere. He brings her to the ground and Olivia can't even get up. The White Mask explains that the red sphere has increased gravity, temperature, and air pressure, and a normal human can't last long enough inside it. She can only curse the White Mask in response and Zem wants to help her, but Kizuna forbids him from doing so because he would also get caught in the red sphere. Suddenly, the White Mask attacks them, and Zem somehow blocks the heavy blow. He then uses his superior mobility to speed blitz White Mask, who finds it hard to keep defending against the quick blows. He is even more shocked when he finds that Zem is turning mid-air by creating invisible footholds. Because of that, his concentration on the Red Sphere loosens, and so do the restrictions on Olivia. She gets up and shatters the Red Sphere with her magic, and then throws a heavy pot at White Mask. He dodges it somehow, and then charges towards Zem after predicting his trajectory. He manages to land a hit on him, but it turns out that it was exactly what Zem wanted. Suddenly, the cross-shaped Kizuna comes flying towards them and hits White Mask directly in the face. Everyone thinks the game is over, but White Mask simply pulls out the weapon from his mask that heals instantly. He admits that they are stronger than he thought, and he was put in real danger just now. So he just escapes from the place after causing a giant explosion. The building is in tatters, but luckily, everyone's unharmed. Well, everyone except Nalgava, who is trapped under the rubble. Zem and Curran rush to help him, but Olivia stops them. Nalgava tells Zem that it is already too late for him because he is also affected by the Yellow Demon disease. He asks everyone to leave him behind and run away before the building collapses, but Zem still casts a pain-numbing spell on him before going. The building starts collapsing, and Nalgava says that he will tell his daughter in heaven the story of fighting with adventurers, and she will surely love it. Zem and others have to run away as the building comes crumbling down, and after a few minutes, it is just a heap of rubble. Zem mourns the death of Nalgava, and Curran tells him not to be so sad because in the end, he saved the soul of the old priest. He is emotional upon hearing this and starts crying again. With that, the Stepping Man case has ended, but Olivia says that they can't relax just yet. White Mask is still out there, and there are people even more powerful than him controlling him. She claims that if his masters gave him permission to use forbidden weapons, the situation is more serious than they think. Putting all that aside, Nick asks Olivia who she really is because she is too strong and knowledgeable for your average reporter. Everyone else also tells her to reveal her identity because they are teammates who fought together. Olivia leans towards Kazumina and asks if he is the Sword of Bonds and he nods. 
She then decides to come clean and tells everyone that she is the Elemental Class Anti-Demon God Combat Training Program, also known as the Sword of War. After the battle with White Mask, the survivors go back to their rooms and spend a lot of time lazing around. They take this time to recover from the injuries they have received and to sort out the things on their minds. Kazumina is bothered by how they are acting just because they have nothing to do right now. Suddenly, Nick gets up from his bed and takes out a broken sword from a drawer that brings back a lot of memories. When he was quite young, Nick was heading towards the Labyrinth City with his parents when suddenly, their carriage was attacked. The little Nick could not process anything at that time, but his mom quickly opened a secret compartment, where they had hidden all their money and put Nick inside it instead. She told him that both mom and dad love him very much, and then closed the door on him. Nick could still not understand anything as he heard the sound of swords clashing and flesh being torn outside. Soon, one of the bandits who attacked them entered the carriage and began inspecting the loot. He noticed the secret compartment under the barrel and tried opening it, but Nick had escaped by that time. Nick bumped into Argus who drew out a dagger upon seeing him. However, he used it to kill the bandit who was approaching them. Argus then hugged Nick and apologized saying that he was too late to arrive and could not save his friends from the bandits. After that, Argus adopted Nick and trained him to be an adventurer. He led him to the area with slime on his first mission as well, and he kept telling him how adventurers should trust each other but not let their guards down. Nick was still clumsy back then and Argus laughed as he slipped on slime. Soon, Argus gifted him a short sword after he became a proper adventurer, but that sword was shattered in a fight against a monster. Nick holds the same broken sword that contains so many memories in the present. He thinks about the time Argus kicked him from the party and wonders if, had he done anything differently, he could have stayed there. He falls asleep, thinking about the past and wakes up when it starts raining later. Nick gets up and sits on his bed, and then hears a familiar voice. He goes to the window and is shocked to find Aggie on the road, humming to herself. She is worried because it doesn't look like the rain is going to stop soon, and then suddenly, Nick lowers the umbrella she gave him at their first meeting. She thanks him and then asks what his name is because she never bothered asking that before. Nick tells her that he is a stray dog who loves idols and she simply smiles. They talk about how it was raining on the day they first met too, and Agate gently whispers that she was also saved because of that day. They keep on talking and even though Nick's hand is getting tired holding on to the umbrella, Agate tells him to keep holding till the rain ends, but it only intensifies. Meanwhile, Zem is in the slums running Nalgava's clinic after his death and interacting with his patients. He feels that the people of the slum really respected Nalgava, which means he was a good doctor despite his evil side. Zem feels that he is trying to take Nalgava's place to mourn him. In another part of the city, Tiana wakes up from her sleep. She looks at the moon thinking about how life seems to be too boring lately. She is feeling detached from her routine life, but still goes to gamble on water horse racing just to keep things the same. Even though no one is out there to hurt or betray her, and even though she's winning at gambling, she is still bored with her life. The next day, the group is assembled at their usual place and Curran is the last one to arrive. She nervously asks everyone if they are doing fine, and they tell her they are. Kazuna notices that Zem's shoes and robe are dirty, so he asks him if he is still working in the slums. Zem affirms but reminds Kazuna that they are not supposed to interfere in each other's private lives. At night, while Zem is sitting in his clinic, Kazuna comes there. He promises that he is not here to interfere but just to act as his bodyguard, because slums can be dangerous. The next day, they meet again and Curran asks everyone if they have eaten. They say that they have eaten something for breakfast and she says that she should head out to eat alone then. As she walks alone, Curran thinks about Kalios and his betrayal. She admits that despite the betrayal, her days adventuring with him and others were fun. Still, she cannot forgive him for stealing the Dragon King's jewel. As she is thinking that, she comes across a newbie who is being scammed by the same pendant dealer who tried tricking her in the past. She teaches the scammer a lesson and sends the girl on her way when suddenly her friends arrive there. She is confused to see them and they reveal that they are here to look at the preparation of the Summer Sleep Festival. Curran doesn't care about the details of the festival, but since there is going to be food there, she is eager to try it out. She begins to wonder if her hatred and desire for revenge will vanish if she keeps living happily with her friends, but she doesn't seem to care much about it either. Just then, Olivia comes running towards them, shouting about big breaking news. She tries to hype everyone up before the big reveal, and only Kizuna falls for her trick. Diana reads the news from the magazine, which says that the legendary dark demon god is on the verge of reviving. Tiana and Nick tell her not to spread so much fake news, but Olivia confidently tells them that she has a trusted source for this news. That source is the good old trust me, bro, and no one is satisfied with that. However, Olivia says that she has some suspicions about the black market from which White Mask obtained the Illusion King's jewel. 
Curran suddenly asks her if the black market deals with the Dragon King's jewel as well. She expresses her confusion to her friends, saying that even though she's having fun with them, she still can't get over her past. Tiana tells her that there is nothing to be confused about and she should chase down her past and confront it. However, this time she's not going to go alone because everyone will come along with her. Zem and Nick also agree, and then Olivia says that they can also find any clues about White Mask when they are in the black market. She wants to find him and then his bosses and continue till they reach the ultimate villain of this world and defeat him. Kazuna is excited to do that, and Nick thinks that he has been manipulated by Olivia once again. While this time everyone else has also fallen victim to Olivia's manipulation and Nick has no choice but to reluctantly join in. Just as he raises his hand with them, the fireworks show starts behind them. They turn around and see that the festival has already started, so they immediately pay it a visit. Nick buys some cotton candy and takes it to Leon in jail. Everyone else also witnesses the fireworks and Curran follows the solo adventurer into a restaurant, and the cat girl she saved earlier follows her there too. Coincidentally, the restaurant is run by Agate's ex Dani. Agate is performing at the festival too, and Nick is enjoying cheering on her, while Tiana is back to gambling. In the meantime, Kazuna and Olivia sit together and talk as two legendary artifact weapons. He asks her what she thinks of the survivors as the sword of war that trains humans to fight against demons. Olivia says that they are the people who will strike down the demon god one day, but that day is too far away. She says that their skepticism is a good thing for now, but they will have to trust each other more soon in the future, but it is up to them when they realize it.